Live long and prosper. So in this video series, I'm going to be talking through the social justice elements of every episode of the original series of Star Trek. Um, the thing that inspired this project was actually a Fox News article which argued that Star Trek has in some way betrayed its traditional commitment to sort of political neutrality or middle ground by embracing progressive politics. In this series, we're going to see that Star Trek has always embraced progressive politics and it's always been aspirational for social justice in various senses. Um, I am taking a broad perspective on social justice here, um, so that may, that may include multiple different types of uh, social justice, whether that's racial, whether that's economic, whether that's religious, whether that's abilities, gender and sexuality, um, anything, anything broadly considered. Um, I will go through every episode. Some of the episodes I will, I will interview fellow Trekkies and talk with them about it. Um, and then below, uh, in the descriptions, I will give you additional information about the episodes, particularly uh, their original air date, who wrote the, the, uh, the screenplay, and who uh, directed that episode. I also want to dedicate this series to my dad, Michael Allen Zapkin. Uh, he was an OG Trekkie from back in the day, and uh, it was watching the original series with him that I came to love Star Trek. So in this video, we're going to be talking about the episode Spectre of the Gun. Uh, I'm once again joined by my friend Matt Page. We're going to uh, talk through this episode. Uh, Matt, thanks for being here. Thanks so much. Um, uh, first of all, I just wanted to say I really liked the uh, the card finale. That was great. It was a big nostalgia fest, and it was a big uh, big emotional ending there. But uh, hmm. to move on to the original, the original series, we are talking about the episode Spectre of a Gun. And uh, as the episode opens, we find our heroes approaching a, uh, a new system, the uh, the Melkos the Melkos system. Is that what it was? Yes, they're all kind of the same. Um, I remember the I last mean, video. I they're there called was a, the Melkots. I don't I don't Melkot. remember exactly what the planet is called. There was a yeah, they're called the Melkots. And uh, they come across this uh, this buoy, this message buoy, and it informs them that it's time for them to turn around and go, and that they're not going to be warned again. And Kirk is like, "Well, you know, we're here to peacefully initiate contact with the with these creatures, according to space or uh, Starfleet orders." So he continues past the buoy, and they transport onto the planet. And immediately, they're all very confused by what they find. None of the transporters work. The communicators don't work. Everybody's baffled. And they are confronted by a floating brain creature who tells them that their crime is punishable by death and that the pattern of their death is being pulled from uh, the memory or, excuse me, the history of Kirk's uh, species as he was blamed for the... Uh, the entire incitement of the of the uh, transgression. So all of a sudden they are beamed over to what appears to be a a movie set of a of a, of a western. And I thought that was pretty ingenious that they were able to um, both save on the, uh, the 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 stage setting as well as echo the um the settings of the old westerns as well as you know incorporating that into directly into the plot because they notice that immediately it's not quite fully formed because there's just like the storefronts there's like a front of a sheriff's art department but the sheriff's department really isn't behind it and the uh the bar is just open air with a with a front to it and so they're approached by a man who identifies them all as as somebody they know and what and it turns out that they realize that they are playing the roles of the uh, the Clanton gang and the famous OK Corral gunfight. 
So they realize that uh, the Earps are trying are trying to antagonize them into into uh, a gunfight all the time, and the only way that they can that they can devise to defuse the situation is to try to tranquilize the the Earps during the during the gunfight. So Bones and Spock come up with a plan, and during the collection of the materials for this plan, uh, Chekhov is killed by um morgan herp and spock deduces that this that um the role that Chekhov was playing was that of uh, billy clanton and that he survived the okay corral so spock knows something is up because they are not playing out what has actually happened in history anymore and the second big red flag that they find and particularly for Spock, is that the tranquilizer does not work. And I thought it was pretty, I thought that scene was particularly amusing because the way that they deployed the testing, they all would have been on the ground immediately. <laughs> but uh, so they find out they Spock deduces that they are not really in reality. And he mind melds with the others to can to make themselves completely sure that they are not in reality and therefore they're able to overcome the herbs and the it's, it seems to be a test by the uh the melcott and they pass and it finds out that they never even left the enterprise and it appears like the entire events of everything past the buoy was an illusion projected by the uh the melcott and so the melcott come and they appear again as a giant floating brain creature. They tell uh, Kirk that, uh, you know, since he doesn't kill and that's the way of his people, he can proceed and a delegation of the Melcott will meet and uh, speak with the Federation. And that's how the- Fantastic ends. stuff. All right. So uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff in this episode. Uh, this is one of my favorites. So. Uh, is there somewhere in particular you want to begin? Um, no, I'll let you start. Okay. So, um, I, I think it's maybe worth just sort of starting at the beginning. Um, the Malcots have a warning buoy out there, and it literally says, hey, do not come to our planet. And... Kirk's reaction is basically, meh, that probably doesn't apply to us. Even though this buoy has, like, moved around in space specifically to get in front of their ship. So, I think this is a, a point worth considering. Like, is there a sort of ethical justification for ignoring that warning buoy and going on to try and meet with the Malcots just because the Federation's intentions are peaceful? Or is this... I don't know, invasion seems like too strong a word, perhaps, but is this is this sort of a legitimate case of trespassing, maybe? I would I would definitely say he he crossed the line a little bit. Um we we know about the the sentinelese who will kill anybody who um approaches uh, lands on the island that's uh that's the island off of sri lanka with one of the last uncontacted tribes and anybody who comes in there is 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 taken care of they kill mm -hmm. them um so there 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 is that there is that uh idea of um the defense at any cost of, of the culture and and what, from what we see in our world, in our real world, and and of course in the the fictional Star Wars, or excuse me, Star Trek universe, there are plenty of hostile races, especially in the uh, in the years of the um, original the original series. Yeah. So, Spock was it Spock or I can't remember, but one of them makes the comment that if they, I think I believe it was Spock that. If they had gone into space, they quickly retreated. So they must have gone yeah. on out there, saw that it was frightening, 
and then set up defenses against any incursion from any of those uh, alien races. So I think Kirk was, he, he should have, you know, a lot, a lot of these episodes seem to hinge on the leadership's should have they should have known known better a little bit but yeah. but uh through to kirk's character his hubris and his his confidence and his arrogance lead him to proceed and go down that anyway because you know in his mind he he's, he's he knows he knows the intentions of his crew he knows who they all are he knows his intentions and they're all peaceful and he knows starfleet but you know they don't know that so they can't mm -hmm. <laughs> Cat time. So they can't uh, be sure, be quite sure of uh, their intentions, especially a point that they make later on is that Kirk did have that desire to to kill to kill the herbs. Yeah, well, they couldn't have judged them based on their thoughts alone. So they kind of had to see them in action, and I thought I thought Kirk did a good job of recognizing that it was a sort of test and he yeah. like he played along with the with the with the local customs more or less he understood like that they were trying that they were trying to be they're trying to bait them into violent confrontation yeah so one of the things that i think is really interesting about um about what you've just said is it really hinge? And I kind of introduced this idea. To be fair, that it really hinges on the idea of whether or not the Federation's intentions are peaceful, right? And I think that's an that's an important point from Kirk's perspective. But I could also see a situation in which it just doesn't matter, right? Like if the Malcots have said stay away from our planet it doesn't necessarily follow that it is stay away from our planet because we're afraid that you might come and try and conquer us or do violence or something it could just be fuck off we don't want you we don't want anybody from space coming to our planet for any reason we're stay happy on. the way we are and so that's an interesting thing like as we find out obviously at the end of the episode when the malcots are like great you don't plan to randomly murder us. Come on by. Like, clearly that was the intention. But if that hadn't been the intention, and, and it's an interesting, I think there's a little bit of a disconnect there because when they first go down to the planet, um, the Malcott who says, you're going to go, the pattern of your execution will be drawn from your own history. He does say, you are outside you are disease mm -hmm. and so like that it doesn't seem at that stage like the issue is really we're afraid you're going to do violence to us it seems like we don't want you full stop and then that later gets changed to now that we know you're peaceful great let's establish diplomatic relations yeah the other but, thing I was thinking, because um, you had you had made the connection to our real world, um, just very recently there have been a series of incidents here in the U.S. where um, either people have like gone to the wrong, typically people have gone to the wrong house and been shot by homeowners or shot at by homeowners literally doing nothing wrong like just coming and knocking on the wrong door and then the person on the other side of that door shoots you so yeah that uh, that sort of idea of like treating everyone who is not sort of immediate insider as a threat definitely has some real world consequences yeah, absolutely. And in terms of the the real world situations that you brought up, they didn't even get the uh, the mechanized warning buoy that the uh, yeah. that the Star Trek Enterprise got. They didn't get a map. They didn't get a warning. They just got uh, shot at. Yeah, and that's what you get when you create a, a society based on based on fear and uh, sell everybody weapons of death. Yeah. So and it's, let's uh, note it's pretty. 
it's pretty uh, it was pretty ironic to hear uh and pretty you know optimistic it, it, it was a very loaded statement in our day and age for ricard to proclaim that humanity has overcome its instinct for violence yeah well and of course he says this in in an episode filmed in 1968 really yeah. at the height of the vietnam war at the height of the the civil rights conflict um Cold War still going on, obviously. It seemed like more of a it's an optimistic. It was a, it was a declaration of optimism in, in that yeah. time, I think. Definitely, but it's still still interesting to think about because we still have not come close to overcoming that instinct. Yeah, and still something to strive for. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so, speaking of gun violence, let's uh, let's turn to the actual sort of core events of the episode. Um, when they're in Tombstone, Arizona, I, I guess we can call it Tombstone <laughs> movie set on another planet, whatever we want to say. So, well, it, it was uh, definitely, I, I'd never seen this episode before. Um, so it was cool because Tombstone is one of my favorite Westerns of all time. So it was yeah. cool to see that story be done on, on, uh, on Star Trek and see how they, how they changed it a little bit. Yeah. So uh, I think there's a lot of interesting stuff to potentially talk about with this storyline. Um, I, I think the, the historicity of the way that it's presented, the, the sort of differences between what really happened in Tombstone, Arizona versus what happens in the episode, uh, the importance of the Western as a genre in sort of shaping these events um, and the importance of the Western in terms of like building a particularly American worldview. So I, there's, those are three big topics. Definitely. Um, yeah. What, will you will, do you want to start us off on, on one of these or all of um, these? I did a little like a, uh... Because I was, I, I looked into, I did a little research on like the Western itself, and um, there's three kinds of major Westerns. There's the traditional Western, the spaghetti Western, and and the revisionist Western. Yeah. And uh, the this episode draws mostly from the the traditionalist Western, which where the lawmen are the good guys, and they always win. Bad guys, they always lose, and it's it's, it's a moral struggle for the for the order of the West. Yeah, um, and I thought, and I thought the episode was interesting because it cast our heroes as the villains, and it portrayed the Earps as violent and unstable, and the the and that the town wanted them gone, more or less, because the sheriff yeah. basically gave them basically gave Kirk carte blanche to kill all of the all, all of the Earps and all of the men, all of those men, Doc Holliday. And they would, and he would basically say, "I, I didn't see anything." Yeah. And then Kirk is like, "No, no, no! I can't do that," because he recognized that as another escalation of, of the trap he's in. Yeah. Either instinctually, or, or else. Yeah. Yeah, I mean the, the character of Johnny Behan, who's the who was the sheriff. He was the actual sheriff of Tombstone, Arizona, at the time of. Uh, or of Cochise County, I think. Uh, I think the way it worked in the Old West, you had a town marshal who, in this case, was uh, Virgil Earp, and then a county sheriff. So Cochise County Sheriff Johnny Bean um, was actually aligned informally with the what the episode calls the Clanton gang. They were actually a faction called the Cowboys and they included a lot more people than just the, uh, the Clantons and the McClowries. Um, but Johnny Behan was definitely on the side of the Cowboys, a kind of against the herbs. Uh, so that's a, that's an interesting element that was incorporated into the, the, uh, the Star Trek episode, yeah, because there's there's that point where Kirk 
goes to Johnny Behan to try and get him to stop the fight in which the Earps are going to die. Or, uh, sorry, in which the Clantons are going to die. And Johnny Behan basically says, the way you get justice is by killing the Earps. And Kirk says so something like, the people better wake up and let the law start working for them. Yeah. And I think that's, and Johnny Bean's response is get down to the OK Corral before the Earps get there and then ambush them and kill them all. But it, I think it's, that's an interesting sort of paradox, right? Because Bean is a law enforcement officer, but so is Wyatt Earp in this version. Wyatt Earp and, and, uh, Virgil are both marshals. I think Ver I think Morgan is a marshal as well, though that's not what not quite as clear to me. I don't remember whether he has a badge. I think like, they were all badges. I think so. Um, all three of the brothers so, were definitely badges. Yeah. So it's interesting that Kirk tries to say, "Let's let the law settle this." But the Earps are also law enforcement. Mm -hmm. So the idea of the law as some sort of like immutable and objective arbiter of, of truth and justice is an interesting assumption that seems to completely ignore the situation that Kirk is actually in. What's interesting about that particularly is that Kirk is assuming the role of, when he's begging the law to sort it out, he's assuming the role of a known uh, thief and yeah. possible murderer. So like he, he's Kirk, but he's also, he's back. He's talking to these people with the context that he has done all of these things that the Glenn boys had done. Yeah. And that complicates his, his his pleas for his pleas for help because they don't view him as innocent of those crimes. Yeah. So no, that's a great point. So it's a, it becomes it becomes it becomes muddied with with the, the lack of the ability to, to to communicate their true identities. Yeah. And they do make several attempts. They do go around saying, "I'm not Ike Clanton. My name is James T. Kirk," and they're like. <laughs> what a hilarious joker you are, Ike. You're okay, so can you, imagine, can you imagine if you were in a conflict with a group of people and you were set to have a gunfight with them the next day and then all of a sudden they started uh, started acting like they were from space? Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. You th no one can blame them for, for thinking they, they had lost their marbles. Yeah. So, uh... The way you just phrased that, I think, is actually really good. Um, set to have a gunfight with them the next day. Because that's one of the things that I find most striking about this episode. That isn't what happened at the OK Corral. Right? Like I, I the the way that this episode presents it is that it was again this very traditional Western, as you say, of like we'll meet at high noon in the street and it's like this preset appointment and things like that. The actual history of the gunfight at the OK Corral was very, very different. Um, the cowboys who were there, um, the, the two Clantons, um, Ike and Billy Clanton, uh, Tom and Frank McClowry and Billy Claiborne, they were just like hanging out after a night of drinking. Like they weren't, they weren't there for a gunfight and they weren't really doing any crimes or anything, but some of them were armed, which was um, against uh, city ordinances as it was in most towns in the West, despite what Western movies would have us believe. And the Earps went down in theory to disarm them. Like it was never in principle meant to be a gunfight. But, and actually, I, in the episode, uh, Wyatt Earp's first line once they get to the OK Corral is something like, 
uh, basically a challenge to draw. But in actuality, I think the the challenge that was given by Virgil Earp was uh, something like, throw up your hands, we're here to disarm you. And then it was after that that the gunfight started. So this idea, it is this very interesting adaptation of the traditional Western film in a way that completely ignores the actual history of what happened at the OK Corral. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. What do you make of that? What do you make of the, the sort of the, the yeah, I mean, like, of history versus mythology almost. A, a lot of a lot of like the early Western, a lot of what it, what it was doing was mythologizing. It was mythologizing yeah. the West, and I think a lot of the reason that was necessary is because as a as a as a society, America is very young. We don't have there's like Europeans in America don't have the rich history of of folk history that you may find yeah. in Europe or other places, or even like the folk histories of the indigenous peoples of the Americas. So a yeah. lot of what the, the Western was doing was creating the folk history of, of the United States. And it was creating heroes such as, you know, White Earp and uh, out of, out of people who may not have been, you know, been great. They were creating, creating heroes out of them, creating people out of old cloth, you know, yep. uh, creating like, I don't know, you have people like, uh, like Buffalo Bill, people or, uh, or, uh, what's the other guy's name? Uh, Paul Bunyan, who everybody says was like 50 feet tall or something like that. The American Tall Tales. Um, yeah. It was just an extension of, of that, of that uh, phenomenon of creating the, uh, the mythology of the, uh, of the American, American experiment. Um, and in that, in that light, a lot of the, uh, I just lost my train of thought. You go, you go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I think that's an incredibly important point. The role that the Western plays in sort of shaping the American consciousness um, and, and particularly right wing consciousness in the U S right. I mean, we had Ronald Reagan who had been a cowboy actor yeah. uh, and sort of brought that ethos to the presidency uh when you you and i in our formative years unfortunately george w bush was was president and the whole sort of attitude taken toward the war on terror by the bush regime was this wild west heroes and villains style approach so that and then, uh, of course, in things like stand your ground laws here uh, in the U.S. And again, these sort of like, you have come to my my front door by mistake. Now it's time for you to die. This sort of ethos is very much, I think, shaped by these Western films in which the hero is a good guy with a gun who kills clearly uh clearly identifiable villains yeah so you have in, in, in that vein you have like um nowadays we have movies like john wick where the the dude is insanely skilled with a gun and everybody he kills is justified because they're trying to kill him yeah and when you bring up in, in the gun to this course when you bring up events like the dayton ohio shooting where the shooter was active for 32 seconds and killed nine people and wounded 16 they're always like, well, you know, if I had a gun, I would have been able to stop them. I'm just like, what do you think? You're John Wick or something? Like, 32 seconds is not enough, and it's not enough time to be able to form a rational response, like when you're under yeah. fire. Like, especially it's, it, for it's people a, without movie, combat training. It's just an action movie mindset that is completely detached from from any real world application. Yeah. So. I mean, I, I think what we're kind of getting at here is, is um, again, this sort of notion that, like, Westerns shape the way that Americans often are trained to see ourselves culturally. 
Um, and especially in the 60s, this would have been true, right? This was the heyday of the traditional Western um, and getting into the era of the spaghetti Western. Uh, and, and the spaghetti Western, I think it's worth noting that while spaghetti Western heroes like Clint Eastwood and people like this are often anti-heroes, there is still a sense that one's problems can best be solved with a gun. Yeah, the way I kind of see like the like the spaghetti western is like the the transition from the the early from from a, from a superhero movie context from the early superhero movies such as like the the, the Christopher Reeve Superman or the yeah. early Batman movies up to the Batman movies that we're getting now that are super gritty, super dark, but in no way realistic completely over the top but but in your face with the violence and moral ambiguity of the characters yeah so uh one of the things i think is really interesting because i i think this is this is all uh spot on this idea that like westerns have played a disproportionate role in how americans understand ourselves uh, and this this episode is clearly driven by Western films and not by actual historical events. Um, I think the ending is really interesting then because Chekhov gets shot. Uh, Billy Claiborne, I think, is the, the one that he's supposed to be. Uh, Billy Claiborne survives the gunfight. Um, so he gets shot, and then at the end of the, the the episode, they're back on the Enterprise. Chekhov is fine. McCoy's checking him out. He's like, "Yeah, that dude's not dead." And I think it's the one of the dumbest uh, justifications for bringing a character back from the dead that I've ever heard, which is that uh, the only thing on this on this planet that was real to Chekhov was the prostitute who wanted to marry Billy Claver. <laughs> uh, I, I got the impression that ever that the episode, like as soon as they had um, made the decision to pass Bowie, they like they were under the the psychic illusion of the uh, of the Milka. I mean, that's entirely <laughs> possible because because once because the. The transition from when they they beat up the herbs is yeah. is a wavy the wavy dreamlike transition, and then they're all back on the Enterprise. Or, yeah, and the buoy is still in front of them, so that tells me that they never ever passed it. See, that's entirely possible. the the only The only reason I'm I'm skeptical of that is because they continue talking about it as though it happened right um so they're like oh why isn't Chekhov dead it's because he didn't believe that these events were real except for the girl um and then spock asks kurt if he wanted to kill on the planet so they do treat it as real events i whether or not that means they were real events and the Malcolm's well, just would, sort of I, I, I wouldn't them say back, that, it's hard to say yeah well I, I wouldn't necessarily just because it didn't physically happen to them that it wasn't real they had a real yeah, interaction right. with a with an alien with an alien intelligence that would have killed them had they made the wrong the wrong choices so and, is, right. and it's something that is in their memory is something that happened so I, I, I can see that they would be treating that as a consequential event, especially because yeah. it was their intentions that, and intentions and actions that were able to save them. Yeah, but I, so the thing that I wanted to to sort of get to with this, uh, and I think this this question remains regardless of whether those events really happened or it was all an elaborate illusion. Um, the fact that the one person who from the crew who has died 
during these events is then brought back at the end. Like, I understand because Chekhov is a, a central cast member. You have to bring him back, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, they could have just brought down a red shirt and killed off some random crew member, as they do all the time. They chose not to. In the context of a story about gun violence and the role of the Western in mythologizing, uh, in, in U.S. mythology, I think it's really striking that no one actually dies. The person yeah. who dies is brought back. So the like the consequences of gun violence are here erased in a way that's even more direct than with like you watch a John Wayne movie, right? And you know that you know that everybody he's shooting is not dying. But here it's sort of overtly signaled that this was all just make-believe and no one has really died. Guns aren't dangerous, almost. Almost. In, a, in terms of like our, our political climate today, I think that's an interesting reading of that, but I don't even think that's something that they even thought about when making the episode. Probably not. Um, yeah, that's, that's a, that's an interesting, that's an interesting reading of it because it, it's, it's not even that he survives or is, or, or learns any kind of lesson. It just basically just didn't happen for him and he just gets yeah. to move on with his life. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, I, I mean, I think, uh, what were you going to say? No, no. Continue. No, so I think um, I think there's some interesting elements in surrounding the the sort of questions of violence within the the OK Corral storyline here, but there's also a larger question uh, of violence in the episode because the Malkots do say you have shown up on our planet uninvited now we get to kill you so I, I think it's also worth talking about that and the sort of the maybe the ethics of capital punishment yeah um it was kind of it's definitely an extreme response to to decide to execute anybody who comes to your planet um, especially when it's just six people with, you know, minimal, minimal armament. Yeah. Um, but again, you, you, you can kind of, you can kind of extrapolate why they might feel that way with the dangers of space and, you know, the existence of creatures, Borg and Klingons and the Romulans and changelings and what have you. Um, so they can't really afford to, to take any chances, but I'm not sure a, a species with the psychic ability that they do possess really needed to resort to basically just murdering people who came, came to their planet. It would have been, I think it would have been far easier to create an illusion where they convinced themselves to turn around and leave or yeah, I think they, were, they 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 chose the the most clumsy uh, method of repelling outsiders from for for a race that has such incredible psychic ability. Yeah, that's a that's an interesting point because actually we've seen we've seen somewhat similar um, decision making in the past from from very advanced species in Star Trek. Um, the episode, The Arena, for instance, where Kirk fights the Gorn, um, you have these incredibly advanced and powerful beings, uh, oh, yeah. the Metatron. The, the and, Gorn are big comeback now in the, uh, the new Star Trek series. Yeah. And, but in Arena, you have um, 
the Metatron, who's basically just like you and the captain, Kirk, you and the captain of the Gorn ship are going to fight to the death. And then whoever loses, their ship will be destroyed. There is this interesting sort of tendency of these very advanced species to test Kirk and the Enterprise crew, often through violence. Yeah, and you also for see that arbitrary reasons. Yeah, you see that um, it's cat time, uh, but you see that uh, that theme continued um, into the next generation with uh, Picard and his conflicts with the entity yeah. Q, and now at the end of uh, at the end of the Picard series, you see that. I don't mean to send any many spoilers, but uh, uh, Q comes to meet J uh, Jack uh, Crusher, who is Picard's son, and offers. He, he well, he doesn't offer. He tells him that the trials of the human race now fall on him, and Q's testing of uh, of the existence of, um, I guess, life in the galaxy as we know it hinges on the decisions of the Picard family for some reason. <laughs> Because everything has to to revolve around one particular captain of the Enterprise. That's how the galaxy yeah. works. Hey, um, there's a new Enterprise. Always that, has always been. The show too. He's on the new. He's on the new Enterprise. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the Enterprise is the existential center of the universe. That that is true. That that is very it true. Is, it was. <laughs> it has existed since before time began, and it will remained long after time's end. Let's hope so. Um, I was just thinking about the uh, the comment that you made um, earlier on Facebook about why we assume that any extraterrestrial species is is going to be friendly to us. Yeah. And, you know, it, I, I don't I like I, 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 I do see that tendency in a lot of the a lot of the supposed um, you know, the like the type of the, the, the the Tyson thinkers, but those kind of those kind of science-minded guys. But then on the other yeah. hand, we do movies like Independence Day, where we clearly see that the uh, the aliens are here and they're here to uh, here to cause some trouble. Yeah. And then we have movies such as um, I don't know if you've ever seen this film, but it's called Annihilation. No, uh, I don't think so. So one of the one of the events of this movie, well, the central event of this movie is that there is a object from space that crashes into um, Earth, and there's a perimeter around this this um, object or whatever it is that is permanent. is is, is like a different dimension. It's it's a perimeter mm -hmm. of like projection of like different physics, different. It, it's and they send a team to go in there after it. And the it basically turns out to be like some sort of blank slate alien intelligence that is here to. It doesn't really communicate what it's here to do, but it basically just learns and mimics and changes, like living living and un unliving tissue. Hmm. And it's in, it seems to be entirely alien in the most alien way we can think of like a, a creature to be to like a human being and it doesn't seem to have like any it doesn't seem it, it, it's not evil in a traditional way it's 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 an invasive species hmm. interesting <laughs> yeah so if you uh if you yeah. were, if get a chance check that movie out it's pretty fascinating okay i will all right. Uh, so I think that's a that's probably a good place to wrap it up. We'll leave it with a, a, a recommendation for further viewing. So sure. Um, I just wanted to actually just mention one more thing yeah, about uh, Western that I really love. Um, Western isn't just an American genre; it's an international genre. You know, first yeah. we see with the uh, we see that clear with the uh, spaghetti westerns and Sergio Leone. We also mm -hmm. see it with the Japanese. Um, yep. There's a lot of cross pollination between the samurai genre and the, the Western genres, and then we we can see you know, up to today in the existence of franchises like uh, Star Wars. Mm -hmm. So the 
Western genre is really is, is beloved internationally. And it also is an international genre because it incorporated a lot of elements from the Japanese samurai genre too. So it's pretty, it's a pretty, um, pretty fascinating genre to look into. Yeah, and definitely over time and, 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 the, and like the, the household names that have, that you wouldn't really think about being like a Western or actually just, you know, a Western, like, like, um, like Star Wars. Mm -hmm. Star Wars definitely. is like the fusion of the Western and the samurai. Yeah. I mean, Han Solo is a cowboy. Yeah, Space absolutely. Cowboy. And yeah. the Jedi are the samurais. Yeah. Like uh, Obi Wan Kenobi was clearly like uh, like the, the last like a last Ronin type of type of character, and even uh, he, it yeah. was, it's it's uh one of the, one of my favorite things about Star Wars is how they they know like the Western and the samurai and the traditional um, even the traditional medieval tales like at the end of Return of the Jedi you see the the evil wizard and the the corrupted Black Knight and the uh, the our hero the young the young knight has to stand against them. It's all like. Yeah. Like the the archetypes of Star Wars is what makes it work. I think the, that yeah. they they draw they draw on the the archetypes um, honestly, and I think like that helps it a lot too. Yeah, I think so. I think that's we're getting a we're getting a little bit away from Star Trek, but I don't care. Yeah, about that at the <laughs> moment, um, I think your point about the, the sort of cross pollination between samurai films and westerns is a, is a is a really good one uh, the other one that i would think of is um i think it's fistful of dollars it's either fistful yeah. of dollars or for a few dollars more the, the clint eastwood movie which is basically a direct um rip off of I forget uh, which Akira Jumbo. Kurosawa film. It was, it was um, it was uh, yeah, that's right, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's basically a direct remaking of Yojimbo in the Wild West. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, and of course that was a western made in Italy. That was a Sergio Leone film. So. Yeah, it is. It is an interesting international genre. For as much as we talked primarily about it as an American genre, yeah, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> yeah, even in Japan, you can even see like how, how it's uh, is prevalent in the anime, like like Trigun, Cowboy Bebop, some of the most well-known animes, and they're all basically westerns. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, Star Trek is an international uh, international phenomenon as well. So absolutely, I mean, in its own way, Star Trek is is a is a deconstruction of the Western tropes. Yeah, because you have uh, instead of having a, a crew that's ready to, to to fire at all times, you have a crew that's ready to have maximum restraint at all times. Yeah. And I mean, so you think about something like um, the prime directive, this idea that we can't interfere with other people's or cultures, which of course they do all the time. And I mean, that's a well-worn observation, but um, I mean, that's like diametrically the opposite of manifest destiny and the push toward uh or, or driving the western frontier of the United States ever uh, ever closer to the Pacific. Uh, I mean, the genocide of indigenous Americans. I mean, yeah, they, they kind they kind of give it to you right at the beginning, you know, space, the final frontier. Yeah. And I think um, in in terms of you know a, a good faith examination of humanity's potential, the the actions of the of the implementation the the spirit of the prime directive and the actions of restraint with, when it comes to the enterprise encountering new worlds is a direct result of learning the lessons of the mistakes 
of the peoples on Earth during the uh, absolutely development of the you know pre Federation. And of course, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of events that happen in the Star Trek universe that that clearly did not happen in our universe, you know, such as the uh, eugenics wars of the 1990s. Yep. And uh, it's, the jury's still out in the Bell Riots. That's next year. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah, well, we'll see what happens. I mean, Star Trek is kind of like the the best of all possible futures in some ways. Yep. So it's a good. Hopefully, we get there. Hopefully, we get. Hopefully, we do. It's a good. It's a good thing to strive towards. Yep. All right. All right. Well, thank you, Matt. This was great. Um, it was good to to talk to you again. It's great to see you again. Great. Thanks for having me.